much for coming today. Uh, please welcome Go Long and Kang Woo Kim. They're coming from Karma, and they're here to talk about the artful design of virtual reality. Cool. Um, thank you all very much. And uh, um, I guess the way we have a structure today is Kang Woo and I will kind of try to represent the lab which grows in size, and sometimes shrinking size so people graduate, but I feel like it doesn't really ever shrink because even though Charles and Nina have graduated, they're still with us. But uh, right now, it's, it's about four of us, and we're up the karma, just up the hill. And the way we structured today's presentation is we're going to kind of go into a broad sense and look at kind of design and art design, and then we're going to narrow and zoom in into virtual reality and then talk about kind of why we doing things we do in VR and how kind of this idea of art and design flows into this idea of designing art play for VR. So I want to begin with art and design. Um, and technology in search of the sublime is kind of a lens to look at this. And by the way, this is where our lab's located, way behind Menchu in uh, these channels. <laughs> <laughs> that's the Knoll, <laughs> and that's a Karma Center for Computer Research and Music and Acoustics. And uh, that's me in my office. And uh, I've been here for 12 years. Kang has been here this is his third, third year. Um, but I feel like I'm, I, I just always, it always feels new to me. I think just, I only know like 5% of the campus still after 12 years because it's too large. Uh, the things that we do really is design. We build things. We're builders. And we create toys, tools, uh, games, experiences, social experiences, all really centered around music and music making. And uh, we're really kind of asking a question that is a set of questions that's around how do we, what is design, how do we do it well, and what are the really artistic, humanistic, and social implications of shaping technology in the way that we shape it. We write a lot of code. A lot of it is in a programming language called Chuck. And uh, because everything you hear today really is generated in a language like this, uh, I'm going to give you a quick demo of Chuck, and later of Chuck and Unity, Trinity. And the first, this is Chuck. And Chuck is really a, it's a formula language for making sound. So for example, we can say, hey, let's instantiate a sign off, I'll call it Kangu, <laughs> and connect Kangu to the DAC, which is the output. Kangu, I'm going to set your frequency at 440, I hope that's okay with you. <laughs> and let two seconds pass, we'll let things go here. Actually, 
has Chuck natively integrated through a, a plugin into Unity where we can actually have timing in Chuck. It's very tightly timed language with kind of the graphics and interaction in, in Unity. And in there, you create this very cohesive way of programming um, and where you can have a really tightly and procedurally generated audio in conjunction with all the things you can do with something like Unity. Um, but we'll get there. So that's, that's Chuck in, kind of in a nutshell. And uh, that. But before we get to really talking about VR specifically, also the things we do include things like the laptop orchestra. Now, I guess in a way, all of the things we do that's not VR flows rather naturally into the things we do with VR. Because in laptop orchestra, we're thinking about the kinds of instruments we're building, the kind of music interactions we are actually working with. And we're thinking about the totality of experience in something like this. So, you know, even though we're working in VR, we're really bringing a lot of the experiences we have in instrument design, sound design, composition, and performance into virtual reality. I, uh, some of design a lot of mobile apps. Um, this is with Smule uh, a long time ago. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, virtual reality lab. You can actually see some of the questions we have here in the VR lab. It's overarching. Hey, how do we design art flick in VR? When new instruments can we craft? How we may we make, how might we make music together in VR? And even this metaphysical kind of question, what is real? And I'm just kind of blown away by all of it. And uh, so let's talk design then, right? So I think this is something that we we all do, right? And uh, it's just naturally because whenever we intend and we do not know how to quite get there, we've got to design something to get there. So that's that's design. So that mentioned Aquavina, which is a practical design. And it's, it's an app for your phone. specificities of the medium. And in this case, multi-touch is used to control pitch through these kind of on-screen uh, buttons. This visualizes breath. Right? This is reacting to when you're blown into the microphone. And tilt is mapped to by the router. Personally, maybe as a group, but maybe just as people, it seems like to us that people do value this idea of physicality, of being physical, because we are, after all, physical beings. And as well as you know, other types of uh, descriptors you, you might assign to, to people. But yeah, we, we have a physical dimension to us. In this case, it's trying to make something out of this medium in a way that is physical. Um, and in a way, everything in Alcrino was designed to make this argument that what you're in fact doing is a physical act and not a virtual one, even though it uses as a digital thing. Um, for one, you don't see the Alcrino on the screen. And that's a gesture, part of this argument that, hey, your phone isn't simulating the Alcrino or emulating the Alcrino. Your phone has, in fact, become and is the Alcrino. And that is kind of an ontological 
argument of saying this is the status of the thing. It's not a simulation, it's not a facsimile, it is the thing. This is all created in gameplay mode. as well as a sprinkle speaker array, which keeps sound local to the instrument. Again, speaking to the physicality of instruments that we want to preserve. This is built by Kia Salad Bowls, and uh, this is what it sounds like. This is one of 200 pieces. In this case, we'll have this interface using this tethered game track controller.
laptop for Mr. Opera or Laptopera based upon the age to recruit tragedy, uh, Lectra. And uh, it's, 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 an, it's, an, it's an opera in three acts. We've done one of the acts and we're still working on the other ones. And so, um, and really we're using various types of interactions to kind of pose a set of questions regarding grief, guilt, redemption. The question also includes you know, how do we break the cycle of violence that we, all of us, experience at some point in, in, in our lives, in society, and using this ancient story but with this kind of very modern technology. It, it cannot help but also pose this question of the medium kind of this technology media society and you know, there's forms of grief, guilt, and a possibility for redemption that might exist within that. Um, again, the medium really is the message. In this case, the tether controllers are used as musical controllers, but also they're attached to Electra's suit and their act is chains. As the music's being played, they're also being pulled down, being really weighed down, in this case, literally by a by chain to grief. Um, and so that's one of the projects we're doing, and, and now back to the VR lab. Um, so there's a couple of things I, I want to show you first. And the first one is something that Kongu designed, uh, which again, not in VR, which found its way in VR. This is what he will be demoing after we were done here. So this is Kongu's MIDI.city. Feel free to turn in yeah. anything you want to add. And it's a musical city. This again is not a VR version. This is a version of the project, actually, for a course. Um, this is how it began. It's a city. I it turns to night. The buildings turn on, but the buildings actually control musical parameters. And a kind of algorithmic generated room. This audio, visual, music, everything is designed to vibe together. The Ferris wheel, if you try it, turns up the volume. Master's. And then he um, came to Karma and did a 
He had a master's in music science technology. And now he's in the PhD program at Karma, which is a computer music PhD. Right? So it's kind of trying to speak to both sides, but hey, this top bar, that's really what brings it all together. The aesthetic lens, the philosophical, artistic, moral lens that gives broader meaning and context in bridging these two legs. But those of you in symbolic systems, I feel like you automatically are being educated to become this kind of person. This is the kind of person that I personally am always striving to be a better version of. Right? So this, I think, captures not just what we do, but kind of who we are. It's like we, at the end of the day, we believe that things we make reflect us. They can't help but reflect us. Right? They're extensions of us, even moral, ethical extensions of us. How the things we make treat its users should be no different than how you treat that same thing face to face. That's kind of part of our core ethos. And by the way, I put all of this into a comic book. And by the way, I brought Stanford HR two copies for, for, for however you, you want to use it. But this comic book, here's the manifesto. In an age of rapidly evolving technology, unyielding human restlessness and discord, design ought to be more than simply functional. It should be expressive, socially meaningful, and humanistic. Design should transcend the purely technological, encompass the human, and strive for the sublime. What is the sublime in design? Well, sublime design presents itself first and last as a useful thing. But nestled within that window of interaction lies the novel articulation of a thought, an idea, a reflection, and a visible truth that speaks to us, intimate yet universal, purposeful without necessity of purpose, that leaves us playful, understood, elevated. Is a transformation so subtle that escapes our conscious grasp that once experienced like music, we would never want to be without it again. Design should be artful. Right? This is kind of the, the ethos underlying the things we do, and that's in a way to why this the question that pervades like, anything we should design as designers and engineers. And uh, yeah, it's a, as I mentioned, it's a comic book. And it goes from buildings to pencil bags to visual design, uh, to instrument interaction design, experiment to artificial intelligence systems with humans designed into the loop, to games, not just for entertainment, but those modes of expression and reflection, to social design. I'll give you one more example before we head into more VR. This is not a VR, this is a mobile app. It's a social care of the app where people can sing, add their voice to a song, one at a time on this virtual globe. Kind of like Ocarina, but you can be like, oh, I want to add my voice to that. A woman in 2011, after the earthquake and tsunami disaster in Japan, reached out. The version that she sang of Rain On Me and invited the world to join, 4,000 people joined her in a matter of weeks. This is what it sounds like. About 1,000 people. It doesn't mean we'll get it right, but I think we should at least try to do it conscientiously. I argue that's just qualitatively better, even if the results are, are just are no, no better. But I think often they are. So uh, that, in a nutshell, is kind of what we work on in the VR lab and really in, in our research group, which is really part of the music computing design research group. And it's a kind of design to help us flourish. You might ask, what's the purpose of computer music in the human society? Not a lot, really, practically, maybe not at all. Oscar Wilde can say all art is quite useless. Uh, I would tend to agree. I think it's what makes art free, that it does not need to serve an external purpose, just like play. What these things are, what we call intrinsically worthwhile. So I think we're trying to, we're building these kind of artful things 
but also designing tools which are useful. This is kind of what we're after. So now, specific to specifics and come move, let's uh, we'll, we'll tag team this. Okay. Um, first thing we'll tell you about Trinity, right? More about Trinity. Now this is Unity and Chakum. Do you all use Unity here, or do you use a mixture? Is it all, anyone who doesn't use Unity? So everyone's like Unity, okay. So <laughs> these are all stuff built in Unity. And uh, and really, like, what you saw that Kamu had in Musical City, in Music City VR, are all going to be Trinity. So that means the sound is generated from, from Chuck. And not only gives you sound generation, it also gives you kind of the strong timing this is a musical sequencer. driven design centered around the life, emotional life cycle of the plant. So in the 
first scene, the first like 12, the first movement, you're looking up, but then you can see that you're one of these seedlings, just like the ones you see around you. And when you look up, that's when the music happens. Now, this is not really a game because there's not a clear goal, right? But it has some game elements. By the way, we've also, like, in VR, there's a couple things we can do. One of them is this, just this simple act of looking up, which we feel is really, really powerful. But if you think about it, looking up in VR is kind of like, well, when do you look up in life? Are you doing something useful? I would argue usually no. You're looking at the sky, you're looking at how tall the building is, you're looking at trees, you're looking at birds. You're just, you're not so much doing as you are just being. So this, again, is kind of like, really I think a study on the duality of form and function of doing versus being. In this case, in the second movement, there are rays of sun that come out, and you now found that you have actually on your two hands, you have leaves. And when you put the leaves out into the sunlight, the music starts going. Right? Emotional life cycle of a plant. This is this is very this is a form of what Jack would call folk design, which is what he's working on his PhD thesis. It's an intensely personal kind of aesthetic driven design. Where it's not designed to be so so much useful as it is designed as a tool for your own self actuation and, and kind of fulfillment. And I think it, it echoes some of the ways that Jack is feeling at the time or trying to, you know, I think this plant isn't just a plant, but also it's kind of all of us. And we need light to grow. And this thing goes for like 30 minutes. Just <laughs> <laughs> here it becomes seedlings that appear, seeds that appear on the flower. So you're not going to embody Right now, you're the flower, but in the next scene, you're going to embody more of these seedlings as they make their, make their way. And it's starting to float into the air. In the fifth act, this is one of my favorites. This is the first one in this movement where there's motion. You're not controlling the motion because you are a seedling being carried by the wind. And you can look to your you look back, it's very sad. There's a seedling that just went back and didn't make it. They're just, just gone. And you look back and you look forward to where you're going, but also you look back to where you come from. And right? never to return. This is kind of, you know, these issues are, the questions deal to our subject. But you can really, it's a place to, uh, to reflect on yourself. That's what this, this is. There's another one. Of course, as you all know, like, watching videos is nothing like actually being inside in this place. Right? So in there you actually feel behind, you feel the size of things, you see your companions see things. So this, you know, this goes on to highs and lows of every act as a kind of a specific aesthetic kind of emotion that's attached to it. So it's all sentiments, right? And as I mentioned, this is kind of a central duality in the way all of us think about the things we design. What are the things you do? For example, it's a game, you're going towards goals. And if you're those goals, that would be a kind of doing. Right? You need to get more points, and you to get 100 points, you gain extra life, or you need to end this level. Those are all doing. This is a very functional concept. Whereas being is just inhabiting, it's existing in the world. It's a form question. Form and its broadest is really just how you exist in the world. And so for us, we're trying to really figure out what the right balance is in any specific situation between these two concepts. And VR seems like it's such a, it's a, such a powerful medium to consider this because you can be, you're kind of being by default, right? And how much you're doing is, is kind of, well, that's, that's up to design. But certainly, as all of you would know, is that you know, narratives in VR will fundamentally differently than in the mediums of, say, framed film, right? It's just the storytelling, because of what the medium is, is just a, just different. Um, this has actually been also put into a laptop orchestra piece as well, where 
actually, so what shall we, do you want to talk about more, any, anything else before we go to demos? Um, yeah, any questions? Yeah, yeah, actually, this yeah, I was really curious about what the like hand motion is, or what the, how do you control in this space? Yeah, so I used the Vive controllers, and you know how there's a touch pad on the, so that actually maps from the animation of the hand from mm -hmm. zero to one. So I can kind of slide my fingers on to make it kind of grasping cool. and releasing. Yeah, different kind of you model of different types of. Yeah. So it's also like a 3D model of the hand. 3D model of the hand and created the animation. Um, and then it's actually all tied to the music. So once you grab and release, it changes the chord to the next one. So you actually have to keep on doing <laughs> these gestures to progress the music. And yeah, and the height um, corresponds to like pitch, and you can um, do gestures as long as you want, and the, yeah, so generative um, in the musical sense. In a way, I guess, I don't know about the value home for me, I don't think too hard what we're going to be on or not. It's funny as that may sound. So when you're in VR, you've got to take in a very specific set of things into account when you're designing. But in a way, like, yeah, you got to do that, but it's kind of, there's some things that just make sense in VR, yeah. and some things that make sense out of VR. And for us, it's kind of figure out what are the elements that make sense. And if it makes sense in VR, it's kind of natural just to do it in VR, rather than trying to say, hey, let's make something in VR, what are we going to make? Right. So, if that makes sense, so that's kind of a general way we think about how it works situations, even though like, it's, it's like saying technology is like confusing everything we do, but you know, the design really works, the technology is, should be the thing that seems to disappear. And so VR for us is, is it's a very specific technology, an incredibly powerful one, because it's so designed to isolate our senses. And you know, so we want to respect that power, but we also recognize it's it is a medium. And I think VR is not just like a mere replacement or like mimicking of the reality, but it's more. It's, it just provides the designers and the capacities to um, reconstruct, augment, and break physics, alter the concept of time, I don't know. Um, so we have so many tools that we can use to make the experience so much more artful, and since it's fully immersive, it's just, the experience just surrounds you the whole time. And I think that's very, very powerful. Um, yeah. So one of the projects that we've done, just look in, um, so uh, Charles has done a number of projects, one in which you were kind of like, Tai chi your hands to create a ball of sound. And that sound is like flowing all around you. Particles both in sound but also in just in VR. Uh, Charles has also made kind of the same system where it records a version of you doing this. And he was planning on making it social so that if you, one of you were doing it in a different place, virtually you motion might appear in time in, in Charles' field of vision. You can interact with and also you can draft the past versions of itself. And because you're recording it, actually, it's kind of uncanny, but in a very, it makes you just stop and pause. Marina, her recent project actually was a museum in VR, which we got to imagine, what does it mean to have a, a museum in VR? What are the things that you can do in VR in a museum that you couldn't do otherwise? And by the way, in this museum, the first exhibit you see is, is a, it's an old, it's like a virtual picture of, of a, an actual photograph is to say, as to say, there was a time when we were in like not in VR, and so it's actually just a picture of Noah. Jack has done a, a number of things in addition. To Twelve Sun is probably his like, largest long-form work, and he's also made a programming language based on actually using Chuck as the underlying engine. It's called VR APL. It's called VR Audio Programming Language, which you are actually programming audio in VR for VR, and so it has all these like virtually tangible things that he's connecting together uh, in VR and those are the design. He's also made a number of strange instruments. 
QBR, for example, like a large canyon drum. Like there's a canyon, and then there's this giant drum. And NPR, like, that's a large drum. How do you play this drum? That was the research question. So he made like a dozen different ways to play the drum, which included like having large giant mallets that you kind of control with your hands, and or like having like basically lasers that you were kind of feeding, or maybe just shooting the drums. And uh, interestingly, we weren't happy with any of this. Because it's just, because the whole challenge is like, you don't have the tactile feedback in VR from just the controllers. In a way, we're just like, we kind of concluded that, yeah, well, maybe someone else will figure it out. Mm -hmm. We haven't figured out how to beat a drum convincingly. That would be one of the things I think would be naturally challenging in VR. Maybe we shouldn't do drums and expect them to feel as good as they are physically, unless we can find a way to actually find, get some meaningful feedback. Um, he has a flute in VR, you can play kind of like opening up your blowing to the microphone at the bottom of your headset. And, uh, and it's really strange interaction because you're basically in VR wearing this thing and you're stretching this flute to change its musical parameters. Or you go like, like you have to blow upwards into the HMD. Um, and uh, yeah. Well, subjects the three year old. Right. So he made Tuny like three years ago. and. Uh, and so we, yeah, we, Chung and I, and many other people are, are like, thanks, Chad, for having this awesome tool, because it is so, it is so good, because you can have like computer generated sound in Unity, and the two just works in seamlessly. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I think you can kind of see the range of what we do, you know, from the fisherman, which is a really kind of an interactive art piece, which place for contemplation, right, to tool building, like tuning would be tool building, or the, the programming language within the audience, a kind of tool. But to us, the, the, the distinction is not always clear, and that's okay. Yeah. Yes? So, what, uh, I mean, it's great to see all this, all these uh, demonstrations of using VR, the strengths of VR, to get towards an art form. What, what for you sort of personally was that moment where you were surprised that, hey, we had this thing in, on the desktop, we put it in VR, or we made something specifically for VR, and then this is something you could only do in this media. Like, where did where did those advantages came from? Yeah. I think I think this demo actually yeah. makes a really nice point of like it's a, it looks it sounds the same, but it feels totally different. And I wouldn't even cons I don't even consider that I think they're both awesome. But they're so different fundamentally. So uh, yeah, I think yeah, like VR. Um, after developing some works for VR, I've noticed that there are so many limitations to the development of VR. You are stuck to this first-person view. You don't have any tactile control. Um, it's you get motion sickness when you're um, suddenly like moving with your computers like staying still. So it's those were sort of the design cons constraints. So if we have some audiovisual work just on our desktop and put it in VR, um, usually almost all the time it doesn't work. So we had to change it and we had to strengthen it with um, some of the values that are only justified in the medium of VR. And yeah, I think we I think there's a very clear distinction that exists between the VR and the twelve sentiments just doesn't work. Barely works in video. It's only because I think you all know kind of what you can kind of more project yourself sort of into VR without being in VR. But I think that's one thing which if you're clicking, for example, on a desktop on like this flower and making this like leaf go to meet the sunlight versus I'm actually embodying the leaf or this plant. It's a, it's a completely different experience, or it's just like any time you're flying, right, and you're being carried away, and there's a certain visceral goodness that just doesn't translate. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's actually a good, I mean, it's great. We, the way we usually work is that we meet kind of every week, but we critique every other week. So as a group, everyone shows what they've done in the last two weeks, and we give one another kind of and feedback and ask a lot of questions. So that's kind of been how the lab has been working. We found that it's kind of like an art studio where we have just regular crits, but it's just like 
critiquing one another. Um, also, I think um, we try to design so that it just implies the medium. So if you're designing something in VR, but it could also as well work on a desktop, we don't really see the point. Yeah. Of why is well, it maybe it just be desktop in that case. Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, these like really awesome kind of art pieces that you're creating um, have like the potential to really have an impact on people. But how are you going to distribute them and give people access to them? That's a great question. Come on. What do you think? If it goes to kind of Jack's folk art folk art view, for at least for the fishermen, um, I don't really have the intention of distributing on like um, beauty or steam or anything, but um, I agree to Jack's folk art idea where I am present while the user is experiencing it. Um, kind of we're in this physical space together. Mm -hmm. um, but if I were to create like a tool, for example, like Jimmy, then Jimmy is, by the way, already on a system. Um, and we would kind of distribute it that way. But yeah. We, we worked on, yeah, it really depends on the nature of the thing. For a lot of what we do, folk, folk design ideas, if you're designing to, even tools, and you're not necessarily meaning to share widely, but with you and a close group community around you. And a lot of it, it actually frees us up. For example, like we really tried hard to think about how do we add any like signifiers inside false sentiments so you know to look up. Because you don't know to look up unless Jack is there and he's like, okay, try looking up. And then you look up. But we always felt like that, you know, you do that if you have to release it to a large amount. You gotta like kind of figure out some way, and you can wait. Those things could take away from the immersiveness of the thing. So I think a lot of times by taking this folk design ethos into account, it's both good in itself, but also it's it some practical benefits from there. Um, so yeah, I don't think we necessarily put our goal to be accepted by, um, or not accepted, but to distribute it to mm -hmm. as many. I think we just designed kind of on our own, and it could be. Um, we hope our papers will be accepted <laughs> when, we pub when we try to publish them. But uh, our s I think it depends. There's, yeah, for example, Kong yeah. was thinking about you know something potentially very social, interactive, and musical. It's one of the projects we're thinking about. If we do that, then we might want to or not kind of involve this a wide group of users kind of throughout the world. And so it really depends on the project. Yeah, same. I guess same for me. Like things I build, you know, like Chuck was designed to be is a tool of design as well. People, Ocarina, Ocarina honestly just felt good. A lot of people used it, and I had no idea that some of the people wanted to link their phones mm -hmm. to make music, and that was just surprising. Um, but I never actually I didn't expect Ocarina to be used by really many people at all, and, and, and so yeah, That's a good question. Yes. I guess building off that, um, so if, if release isn't really a, like a objective, I guess, um, if you do build these kind of experiences that still can have like significant uh, like emotional and um, personal impacts on people, do you act, do you like show these to other people in the lab itself? Like do you bring anyone else in or do demos or anything? We do. We have almost quarterly open labs. And we, we, I think what we'll do is I'm going to open just a text editor here. Feel free to add your email if you like to this and we'll notify you of additional events and also as well I'll send you uh, whenever we have the PR related events happen at Karma. But uh, yeah, we, we generally have it and we, we kind of show that quarter's work and it's, it, it's always really fun. And because the lab is it's not that big, we usually have several showings. And so, um, yeah, we usually have three sessions of 50 people each and we kind of repeat uh, throughout the day. And we do write about this, for example, doing versus being, even though Jack the design is something very personal to him and, and he's documented, but we've written this whole, written up kind of this, almost like a practical philosophy of kind of artful design through the kind of the lens that he used in here and, and really 
engaging with this idea of doing versus being, we're hoping some of these ideas can flow into this other people design completely different experiences. And uh, an artful design is kind of the other lens we use quite a bit on the uh, For me, it's the tactile control. Um, the buttons and the touchpad just have limits. Because music is very gestural, and there's a lot of like, for example, we can't really put a piano, and we can't feel the, the touches in VR. And um, for me, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the tactile. But I, I saw there like gloves now, and like cool things yeah. happening. It's so. like a force exoskeleton that can pull it back, right? Or like, maybe that has a lot of musical applications, but it still would need to design very specifically towards those, yeah, me too, yeah. something like that. Anything speaking to the physicality, anything that can be designed to speak to this physical dimension that we have. Right now, the physical dimension of VR for us is a lot of gestural things. So in the song of Fisherman, in the empathy scene, there's kind of this motion, right? So there's a lot of things that you, we, uh, yeah, yeah. body I, I, gesture is good. I want to be free. Yeah, musicians use their hands so much, right? So it's like right now we're more like dancers. Because dancers are like the full body, whereas musicians is more like, I mean, it's kind of a mixture. Like musicians mostly are, I think about just about any instruments, so like the craft of using their hands. Yeah. Cool. Shall we uh, yeah. go to the demo? I actually have to do like the roots. Okay, why don't you go do that and I'll answer if there are any last questions while I stall yeah. for time. Um, yeah, what are what are you all looking at? We're, we're curious and maybe I can, I can turn the table on you and, and see what you're interested in and you're interested in, in various arts. By the way, like, Rabbit Hole is, was a really good name. <laughs> I know Stanford XR is like, like brandable and functional, <laughs> and have nothing wrong with it. Like, man, rather than holding up, that was such a good name. So, I, I want to, as an outsider, I kind of want to be like, even informally, you can like get like Stanford, like nickname, rabbit hole XR, or something like that. <laughs> and I, just, I just thought that was like, such a perfect name for the AR. Stanford XR is good too. So, that's my, my future request. Uh, it, what are you, what are you all just working on? Or just, Specific that that's not meant to be any kind of replacement for the physical plaque, but I thought the AR was just one of the Yeah, there's, there's something pretty beautiful about that network, so we were heartfully struck. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's interesting because it seems like you know, there's things like are you building a tool, are you building something kind of for social change in a way, which I think that. AR experience, and then are you building something that doesn't necessarily solve any problems immediately, but can help you be, a, be better at being you, right? And uh, so like, I 
feel like for us, all of those are. You can go and solve very direct problems, which is great. I'm an engineer. I want to do that. And then there's kind of social principles that we really want to speak to. And like, in computer music, we, we kind of by default fall into this third category. It's like, I want to make things that help me just be you know, this. Are there any other projects? Does, 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 do you all meet like, regularly as a group of this group, or is this kind of an interest group? Yeah. So this like, event is open to Usually get together, act together, like code together, or is it? I wonder. I'm just throwing this out there. There might be like Stanford XR, like Karma, like hack session, hackathon. Mm. One of these days, <laughs> we, let's just get together, and work on whatever you have to work on. <laughs> We'd be even happy to give like a Trinity tutorial. To anyone that's interested, as part of the hackathon, yeah, so you can like, really integrate sound into whatever you're doing in the community and, and see if that's something. But we, I think, I don't know, Kamu, I feel like there's a yeah, natural I've, resonance. I've, 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 I have, I want to learn a lot about VR. Me too. Usually, my experience it's, has been bounded inside Karma, so mm -hmm. um, there are lots of things that I don't know about. I would love to like we share some knowledge and accession together. But we find some food find the food gap. But yeah. That would be great. <laughs> great. We would love that. Okay, cool. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about like the community workflow? Like how it how it works? Sure. So there's a couple of points you can do it, but basically there you get a Trinity Chuck asset, and within there, there is basically a, what's called a main instance. That's your general Chuck. That's your Chuck. But then you have sub instances, which you can assign to game objects or prefabs. Um, and those basically just has to be, those are all synchronized globally by the main Chuck instance. The sub instances can be spatialized or not. So if you want it to stereo or whatever you want, that's totally fine. But if you want to assign it to game objects that have specific locations, that's also just have to check a box, check, check a box, and they'll be able to spatialize according to various parameters you need to define. And then what you would do is uh, basically you write Chuck, entirely Chuck code um, that you can run from C sharp in Unity. But there have been special kind of keywords that have entered into, ch into Chuck that allows you to share data very readily. Because at the end of the day, you're working in two completely different languages. And you know, one way you can go is to use something like open sound control and send basically network messages. But that's that's cumbersome. That's useful, but cumbersome. What we want is something that's more like, hey, I want to get the value, I want to get the value of where the playhead is in my sequencer that's in, that's being timed by Chuck and to draw that playhead in Unity. How do I do that? Well, there are ways to synchronize floating point integer and other values. There are events that can be like, oh, there's a collision that's detected in Unity. I would like to add to play a sound or a trigger a musical passage. There's now, you can actually use a mechanism where you basically just trigger an event that Chuck side is listening for. And so it's really flexible. There's like a two-way communication mechanism that's it's a little extra work, but it feels mostly native. You don't have to go out of your way of thinking about just you know, accessing data. Uh, and from there, it's actually like from that's kind of the basics, and it's not it's quite simple, which I think is why it's powerful. Because from there, really the complexity is, is only is not limited. It's just now you can just expand out the Chuck side and the Unity side, so you figure out how to architecture. Anything else to add? So it's so it's everything's just generated in real time. Mm -hmm. So if I just wave my controller. <laughs> I can use this height to change the frequency of like a clarinet sound, mm -hmm. and it'll be like, Ooh! and like, so it's not just sound effects or just playing background music, but it's actually mapped to whatever floats you assign, and you can just generate everything in real time. I think that's the powerful. Like, that's fun. Yeah. 
sounds like y'all y'all are in your unity. We can we can teach you Trinity in, in, in a short time or long time. And uh, maybe that could be our first collaborative. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it's exactly what Homer said. We're we're like at the end of the day we do a lot but we don't really know we don't feel like we know what we're doing. Which goes with the, with the, the joke which I really believe in is that if you knew what you're doing you wouldn't be research. So I guess we're doing a lot of research because so we're always we we super, super welcome with like just working together and thinking about different ways of doing it. So uh, yes. I have a question. I really like your book because uh, you can actually move through the book it's because it's a comic and it's a lot of ideas. You can just move up and down in any direction. So my question is, do you think about spatializing your book, like taking these ideas and putting them in space so you can actually move spatially and uh, look at them from upstairs and see chunks which belong together? Because the book is nice to move around, but you don't get a map of it because it's still a book. Well, Memory Palace, the for Artful Design comic book, <laughs> in VR, right? And it's like a, what? Actually, there was a time when I thought maybe this book could be written in VR. Yeah, I, I think I didn't know what that would even mean. It would have to completely ask this question: What does it mean to have a book in VR? But maybe now that there is a physical book, it'd be interesting if there are kind of the pages and concepts or things are kind of like almost like hyperlinked in VR, or maybe they're in a house. And, Hey, if that's a project that someone would like to do together with us, maybe that's another point of collaboration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, that's And it also goes to other people outside, like Mark Weiser and other people and their papers and their that's ideas. That's true. So you can actually see the idea and see in mind wise where it goes back and where it comes from. And you can actually also hear things which you can't do yeah. in the book. Right? See you, John. All right, so maybe let's, shall we move to the demo and check out what we see?